This week, we are talking about Indiana Jones 5, the podcast behind the bastards and 700 Sundays. And now your host, Mike and Deglio. What is up, team? Welcome to KM Geekly, just a sneak peek at two geeks talking about some of the things that are going to be getting them through their week. Thank mm. you for joining us. Welcome to another week. Happy 4th of July. Which, I mean, for whatever to be happy for, or celebrate. Uh, bombs bursting in there, right? Bombs Mike? bursting, yep. Uh, uh, hide your dogs, hide your wives, because none of them like that sound anymore. I, I, no. Were you a firework guy? I enjoy fireworks, but like, especially now, I'm like, eh, do we need all that? Is that really good for like, you know, but when you're. When you're eight, right? All you think about is like boom. And now I'm like, mm-hmm. I think about the dogs, about like the environmental impact. Cause like, yeah, this is really. Uh, we, do we, we need this. Yeah, I, I mean, there was a time when you were a kid and you would like go with your family and you'd sit in a big park and all these people would gather and there was like a weird sense of danger because people might catch on fire, or blow up. It was at least oh yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. It was like there's a there's like fifty fifty chance I'm gonna see somebody die in a ball of flames. Surprisingly, I still feel that because I live in Pennsylvania and one thing. So Pennsylvania is interesting in that you can go block to block. It can be very, very like liberal type of place to very conservative uh, in, mm-hmm. in block to block. But one thing that is ubiquitous here in Pennsylvania are tents in parking lots and giant warehouses full of fireworks. Legal, mm. illegal, bazooka. <laughs> I mean, it is crazy. So. You never, even in New York, where it was very close and cons- and it was, you know, Fourth of July, there's fireworks everywhere all the time. Oh my god! Like coming, in fact, com- during like pandemic, literally coming in our windows. Yeah, craziness. Here, it there's a sense of things might blow up uh, all of the time. So there's there's that. Anyway, uh, I don't. We don't really have any plans for Fourth of July to do anything exciting. We were going to go to the beach. You went to the beach at least. You got some beach time. Brief. I mean, I, I went near the beach. I didn't yeah. go to the beach. That's fair. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, I knew it so was there, like you know, a couple blocks away. So another it's thing optics. that is that is big here uh, has always been for me is, in fact, I remember one Fourth of July going to the boardwalk in North Wildwood, New Jersey, and seeing Independence Day. That was one of the first sort of uh, big blockbuster summer movies. Oh, I remember going to I, see. I it. remember seeing that. Lo- yeah, I saw it in the theaters too. Uh, Six Vermont. And I've really wanted to do a lot more of that this summer. I talked about it on this show. I want to be going to some blockbuster movies. But now that they come on the streaming so soon and- Oh, have I talked you out of going to the movie theaters? Well, a little bit. I did see Wes Anderson's uh, Asteroid City we talked about. Yeah. I, it, it, Guardians is going to be on on demand next week, so I, I, I can't bring myself Aren't to go Aren't we talking pay for about that. Indiana Jones today? But, Keith, okay, I did last night- Get to see Indy, despite hearing absolutely destructive buzz coming out of cans and then in some early screenings. But there's been some other people saying, hey, it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to render my opinion. Jen and I went to a 1030 show, Keith. Oh, God. We got You're out. You're over 40. What are you doing? We got out close to 2 a.m. Like 1030, 1030 a.m.? I'm there. We, we. Well, we were going to cancel about four times. And we said, we kept saying, we could do, we used to do this all the time. We go to midnight movies in Astoria all the time. Come on, we're not old. We're not old. Man, it, Jen brought a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> she brought a blanket. Uh, it was, she She fell asleep. She nodded off like, a few times. Like a, but a, a Ziploc bag full of loose nuts and prunes. We brought some La Croix, some sparkling water, <laughs> a blanket. It was, it was something. We had a blast. So I'm, we're going to talk about it today. Uh, oh yeah. Keith and I were just talking about before we aired just about how man, you're not kids anymore. Kids, man, those summers, summers as a kid. I mean, it's nice mm. here. We got the pool. I love summer still. I hate humidity, but I love summer. That's hard. And it's just not responsibility and life. Just really, it really ruins childhood. Keith <laughs> makes you <laughs> long for childhood even more. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like. It's uh, you. You spend the rest of your life both like mourning the loss of and like realizing the destructiveness of said childhood, and so you spend like you spend the next sixty years dealing with some sort of strong feeling about the first fifteen. 
So, you know, sometimes, you know, we always talk about what, what would you do if you go back in time or what would you change? Blah, blah. I would just want to go like find me in the summer around eight, seven, eight, nine, ten years old and just like look myself in the eyes and be like, you better savor this, buddy. This is it. This is the best of the best. It doesn't get any better than this. We would play wiffle ball all day because it would stay dark. It would stay light until like nine o'clock. And I would just dread to hear the sound of my dad with the sliding door. I could remember still can hear the sliding door in my backyard. Mm. And you'd be like, Mike, Tina. And that would mean it was time to come in. Uh, but man, those were great nights. Great nights. I remember summer, 4th of July, we would go down the shore because my grandfather's birthday. He was a Yankee Doodle Dandy, Keith. And uh, we would what? go down there. A Yankee Doodle Dandy. He was born what, on the 4th what? of July. Oh, is, it, is that what that means? Yeah, I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, born on. Well, I mean, the I've heard of, the yeah. phrase before. I, oh, I didn't, I didn't, I'd never heard the second half of that phrase. Yeah. So, uh, I've got a Yankee Doodle sweetheart. Maybe it, it might be. Maybe the song should be canceled. I'm trying to think if it gets an inappropriate. Like, anyway, <laughs> when does it become horribly racist? It's probably in there somewhere. Anyway, I'm just rambling because I haven't talked to people in a while. <laughs> Let's start the show the way we always do with my. F- Actually, we don't always start it this way. I'm sorry. I've we already always, no. We always start with with Mike's first ramble. monologue about something Keith hasn't seen. Uh-huh. So it's it's here. Here we go. Mike, take it away for 25 minutes, and I'm going to go. Uh huh. No. no uh huh. Because I don't want to give any spoilers. This movie can be rife for spoilers. Yes. Yep. Yeah, please don't. Please don't give any spoilers. Because I actually am excited to see yeah. this. So first things first. It should be stated that outside of just being a child of the 80s. And, you know, loving Indiana Jones because it was like Goonies, like your Star Wars. It's part of that, part of the pop culture Classic. fabric of our right. upbringing. I would not consider myself a mega fan. I don't go back and rewatch these on a yearly basis. I couldn't quote all of the beats to all of the movies or the lines. It's not It's not one of them that lives in my, like, upper echelon of favorite movies. I love them. I appreciate them. When they're on, I watch them, uh, three of them. Uh, Crystal Skull, I remember seeing and not enjoying. I didn't have a huge problem because of the the sci-fi elements or the supernatural stuff or what. I just... It's always been supernatural. Yes. Uh, I just didn't... uh, It it didn't do it for me. I think the the LaBeouf of it all and the the feeling of passing of the baton didn't really feel well, feel great. I just didn't love it. I don't think I've ever... I've watched it since, to be honest with you. I watched it actually. I rewatched the first four like last mm-hmm. week actually, because um, I I I do like the series. It's it's complicated because like my favorite of them, ironically, is Temple of Doom, which is like oh, unbelievably racist looking yeah. back on it in time, and and it's sort of like oh my god, this is so fun, and like oh this is really problematic, and it's like. It's incredibly misogynistic. It's incredibly racist, but also like, oh, they're on the carts. <laughs> you know? It's indie, right? And I would say that some of the hallmarks, right? The 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 visual imprints of indie. If is speaking, we were talking about Wes Anderson. It's sort of the, the 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 fingerprint of this franchise is obviously Harrison Ford. The action is very stylized in a way. It's never. It doesn't feel. It's not a grounded sort of John Woo action. It's very no. It's it's based on the serials, like. Yes, it's very pulpy. So let me cut to the chase. Yeah. We had a ton of fun with this movie. And that is, I think, the period, put it on the box statement. I think that's what you go for. That's what you get. Now, they kind of tied it up in a nice little bow at the end of Crystal Skull. So I think the 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 the, the personal MacGuffin they use... There's kind of two MacGuffins to get him out of indie retirement, right? There's a personal right. angle, and then there's the, the the artifact thing. I think that the artifact thing is kind of a wink and a nod you and I will appreciate because it's pretty much just uh, Ben Sisko's clock is what they're looking for, <laughs> which just makes me laugh. Uh, and they both worked for me. I can see where they could be a little divisive, each of those things. But for me, they both worked I think that the action, even though this is directed by James Mangold, so it's you know it, it produced by Lu, uh, by Lucas and Spielberg, they're both producers on it. Uh, but it's a Mangold it's the directed film. First one film. Spielberg didn't direct, yeah. correct? Yeah. But it but it keeps a lot of that vibe. It, it it does feel very there's a there's a whimsy and a, a humor baked into the to the 
to the action of it. The the one liners are there, and the thing this this has so much better than Crystal Skull, at least to me, is side characters. Um, Phoebe Walter Bridge is Helena Shaw, and she is from Fleabag. She is just perfect. Uh, she's great. There's a sort of new short round type of character. Uh, mm. I won't say much about that. I think is is really excellent. Uh, some some returning friends from the past uh, make cameos that I think work. And there's the thing that sets it apart here is that there's a really usually you know I think one of the things about Indy is he's kind of his feelings are a little repressed. He's very <laughs> '80s guy. Right, feelings right, are a little repressed. Right, right. Can't really say say the thing. He's like your dad. He can't tell you he loves you, but you know he does. Not your dad. Not my dad. My dad says it. He reminds me. He's my dad. Uh, Yeah. Anyway, in this, he there's there's a lot more emotional stakes for Indy, and he is more emotionally communicative, which is a new thing. Hmm. And 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 they kind of explore that, and it it really works for me. So on the whole, I had a great time. I actually like the way it wraps up too. I think it leaves him in a place that's a little less fairy tale and a little more right for indie for me. Let me tell you what uh, doesn't work for me. A final thought and then I'll, I'll close it. Yeah, and then I have questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. Generally speaking, we're in a weird place when it comes to CG in that- That was gonna be my um, yep. We're in that uncanny valley where, so the whole opening set piece, I won't tell you what it is, but it's it takes place in the past to kind of set up the whole right. And they, turning. I, I know they de-age him. There's a de-age, and it's just, we're not in a place where that works for me. You get what they're mm. doing. It doesn't spoil the movie, it doesn't jump out, and you're like, forget this. Obviously, they have to do it. But instead of just like completely CGing him, it seems to me like they de-aged his face and had Harrison Ford, and because it looks like... It's, I think they it's, did, yeah. It's old voice and old limpy Harrison Ford with young indie body or in, young indie face. And it's just sort mm. of, it's just like weird. Just It just sort of is weird. That, and also one of the things I love about Indiana Jones, and even though I know a lot of the stuff is filmed on Backlot, I get that. But there are those scenes where they're in the desert or they're they're going to the cave and they're at the place. They go to the place. Yeah, and because yeah. It's, of, it's very uh, iconic. It feels very epic. Yeah, it feels epic. It's in that 24 frames and the the, the haze of the desert and the the and here there's none of that. Like you can tell you Ugh. you can tell exactly when they're like it's a green screen behind them. There's a scene where they're on a train. I won't say much about it, but you're like, that is just, I've seen better computer, I've seen better computer games do that better. Uh, so some of that kind of sucks, to be honest, but not nearly enough as much as you've read about. It did not bother me as much as any of that. Mm. It, it just, yeah. and what can you do? Uh, maybe there's ways around it, but it, I guess it is what it is. But because of Indiana Jones of it all, a lot of those chase sequences and action sequences that aren't as great are shot in super close up as they do. And you know, the mm. punches and everything. It's, right, it's right, the style right. is all there and it kind of hides a lot of the the problems. So it, I didn't hate it, that stuff, but it is noticeable. Mm. Lastly, I'll say, and I've, I don't think, I don't know if, there, I'm sure there have been critiques about this, but it didn't bother me actually. So Indy started a sort of whole pop culture branch that that in video games which is something i love has really kind of uh taken a foothold so two ma main two things i would point out is your lara craft lara croft and yeah, the uncharted right. series with nathan drake and it's impossible not to uh taste notes of those flavors in this movie be them character mm. beats, whereas- Interesting, uh, like the, the snake ate its own tail. Yes, it's an Ouroboros of uh, Indiana Jones. The Phoebe Walter-Bridge character, Helena Shaw, without giving too much away, her backstory has sense of Lara Croft, uh, <laughs> sure. right? Chasing down her father's blah, 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 blah. Right, right. Uh, Indiana well, that's jo Spielberg too. Spielberg is all about yeah. fathers. Uh, Indiana Jones, Coming out of retirement uh, is very Nathan Drake in Uncharted 4. In fact, there's a train sequence here that you're like, wow, didn't they do that exact sequence in Uncharted 2? Mm. Who, did, who, which came first, Indy or the egg, you know? Uh, but instead of, you know, when we talked about Deep Space Nine last week or uh, Strange New World and you felt that they were cribbing from the Alien series, you can't, you can't really uh, 
accuse Indiana Jones of cribbing these other story ideas, it's sort of, they were paying homage to him. So it's all... The, 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 circle, the circle completes. The circle it, completes. It's neat. In fact, there's one part where they, I think it's a kind of an Easter egg. They, they, they fake a joke about, this isn't giving anything away, fake a joke about... Indy potentially being framed for murder and having to escape. And I was like, oh, huh. like the fugitive? There's a, there's some things like that. And I think the fact, and and all of those notes of those games and the pop culture references that stuck out to me, I'm sure there are so many more, people who are more in, steeped in it, just reminded me of the iconic nature of this and how mm. be them good, be them bad. This is probably the last one we're gonna get with 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 Harrison Ford. And I think... He's much better in this film than he was in the last. He seems more more committed to it, to the character and to the to the performance beats. More invested in it. Yeah. More invested in it. And I just got to say, man, uh, maybe it's because my expectations were set so low based on some stuff I was hearing. I really had a great time. I will absolutely revisit this movie. It's a little long. Uh, it was about That's two fun. hours and 40 minutes. Oof. Yeah. And I went at 1030 and it didn't start till close to 11. So it was a late one. But uh, even CEO Jen mostly stayed awake. So uh, I highly recommend Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, folks. Oh, <laughs> speaking of the supernatural, this one goes, goes somewhere. Well, Nair I mean, gone before. I, that's all I'm going to say. It's I probably at the peak of what a human being could even, even fake as... Uh, Suspending their 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 disbelief, but it worked for me. So uh, well, your I mean, results may vary, but that's what I'll say about it. I mean, they they melt multiple people and they pull a beating heart out of a still alive person. So, but but I I, I do I actually did find the alien of it all in Crystal Skull to be jarring because the first three had been sort of religious artifacts mm -hmm. as opposed to sci fi. Um, you know, still, you're, it's still in that sort of fantasy world. But, um, yeah, I mean, for me, this one I'm I really sticks disappointed. On a, sticks on a sci-fi. You know what? I don't want to say anything. I'm going let to it, let it just be. Yeah, I mean, if there's a clock involved, I'm sure it's time travel. Um, but the, I, I, think, I think what disappointed me about Crystal Skull, and I'm disappointed to hear this continue, it was less about the characterizations and less about the you know, uh, Shia LaBeouf of it all. It's the bad CG. It's that what makes the first three so magical is the effects are practical. They are actually out there in the desert. That's actually Harrison Ford hanging off of a tank mm -hmm. or in a U-boat or whatever it is. And that it had this, this tactile realism to it that um, made it much more exciting because like, mm -hmm. oh my God, that's actually a tank actually going through that thing. That is actually a whatever. And, and I, you know, and we've talked about it at nauseum on the show before crystal skull is like, oh, okay. So it, nothing is real. It's all just sort of CG. So like none of it's impressive. If it's CG, it's not impressive. It, I'm just, it's just not it's more not egregious plot, a silver lining slash egregious. It's weird, but there are definitely a great amount of practical sets and uh, and set pieces here, yeah. which make the ones that aren't a little more jarring. Which is yeah, it, yeah. Uh, it's it, and you know what? I, I've been having this thought lately, and then we'll, we'll move on. But I, I've been watching a lot of these sort of big movies. Um, you know, the, the 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 Marvel stuff, the DC stuff, the whatever, and I feel like the CG has not improved. Yeah, in the There's last 10, 15 years. Bit. I was I was watching a little bit of Man of Steel last night, and like the CG's not great, and it looks exactly like it does today. It's it's like we're like, eh, good enough. And it's and the embar it's just, embarrassment of riches, right? It, it, that's what it's I felt not, about Avatar it's an 2. When you see Avatar of 2. I, I, Avatar did, I saw 2, Avatar 2. Yeah, it's the it's the the peak of what we can do, and it's impressive. But at the same time, it's not like it's not good enough. I'm sorry. It like and and I know Avatar. Like Avatar Two is very very good. I mean, it, it is the absolute it's still rendering of, Avatar Two. It's, it's it, the <laughs> pinnacle of what we get right. The pinnacle of what we can do right now. I still don't buy it. The face, the facial movements, the lip movements. I I still don't buy it. It's still Uncanny Valley for me. And while the action sequences, Cameron, 
like the the action of it all looks phenomenal. The rendering of all that is great. Um, and he, but he just the faces aren't there yet. The faces aren't there yet, and it's really disappointing. But everyone else, the action sequences look bad. They're not. They're they're barely a click, but above a video game, and it just it's it becomes mind numbing and boring. Whereas these practical effects, you know, watching the first three indies, like what they were able to do, were they able to do as crazy stuff as they do CG? No, but was it ten times more exciting? Because you knew it was actually happening, absolutely, and it's it's I'm it's it's annoying and disappointing because it's just not exciting. It's not well, exciting they're, what they're doing now. It doesn't matter what they come up with visually. It's not exciting because I know it's not real. There is a first person action adventure Indiana Jones video game narrative based uh, that is on the horizon, and I'm excited about it. And this movie made me more excited about it because it it just shows that. Because we can make those kinds of video games, that's this is that's kind of how I want to experience it. Because, yeah. uh, but it I is mean, exciting. It, it's a good movie. High recommend for this movie. I right. really enjoyed my time. Keith, okay, I'm, let's I'm pop over to you. Checking it out. What were you? What have you been putting in your ear holes lately? Well, I'll tell you what. You know, I the uh, this summer I try to get out and uh, get my walk in every day, and I have been. Um, I got clued into a podcast by my brother Sean, who said that they uh, they did. A, a whole series on Vince McMahon, which mm. was like that piqued my interest, and so this is a this is a podcast audio only um, called Behind the Bastards, and it's hosted by Robert Evans and Sophie Ray Lichterman. And Robert Evans has an interesting intersection. He is a former war journalist and historian, and a writer for Cracked before it closed down. Mm. So, the, what it is is it's long form exploration of like the shittiest people in history. Right. And so sometimes it's about like, you know, dictators and like Mengele and that kind of stuff. And sometimes it's about Vince McMahon or they just, this week they did, they did one on, on the death sub guy, the guy who ran that operation. Oh, cool. How are, they, they are they, are they multiple ser- like parts? They're multiple parts, depending on the, on the person. McMahon got like five episodes and um, Death Sub Guy only got two, but it, it really sort of depends. And so you you have this mixture of historical understanding and analysis. And I'm like I'm like learning about dictators from Paraguay in the 20s, which I had no idea the history of. And it's like, whoa, that's really interesting. Um, and but the other thing they are they're really really funny. So they bring on other like smart comedian types. And so um, the tone of it is much lighter than you would think, considering how dark okay. all the topics they're talking about. But it's it's both hilarious, but also really informative. Like I learned a lot about stuff that I I didn't really know about. Um, and so you know, are they a little fly by night? They they do a little bit. I mean, they they do the research. Sometimes it's a little quick. Right. Mm-hmm. So they, they don't dig in as deep as I'd like them to do sometimes. But a lot of these, especially the older time stuff, it's pretty well established fact and information. So, um, yeah, it was definitely it's it's a really good listen. Um, it's entertaining. It's funny. They're smart. Um, and at the same time, you're also learning about stuff that you just really didn't know diving into these worlds you know, sometimes it's a dictator, sometimes it's a pop culture figure, but just learning about like shitty people, and um, it's it's really fun. It's hilarious. Uh, I definitely check definitely check it out, Mike. I think you would certainly enjoy oh, the I'm, Vince McMahon I'm so of it all. I, I like um, a good podcast for like my walks too, and and yeah, a, a lot of mine are pop culture related, and I need a couple more history and fun ones. And most of the ones I do that are that are history ish are all like NPR. Radio Lab type yeah, stuff. Yeah, th- so this, this this is, is like different. you know, like if if NPR were stoned, it was sort of, and and you're and, speaking and, my and, language. and they were like willing to like speak the truth and like have a sense of humor about it. Cool. Uh, I, I it's definitely definitely worth a listen. Uh, I, you know, and you never know who's going to come up next week. So uh, it's it's fun, and they have a huge archive going back like forever. So you can really go back and because it's not topical, right? You can sort of pick mm-hmm. your tone. Yeah, like, cool. do I want to hear about like a Kardashian today, or do I want to hear about like some horrible Nazi doctor? Like, it's whatever you're sort of feeling that day. Cool. So, yeah, uh, yeah check it out. Behind the Bastards, it's available on all your podcast feeds. 
Sweet. Uh, another thing I wanted to quickly mention, Keith, was uh, my mom was over and we were looking for something to watch and and we sort of, she saw Billy Crystal's face and, you know, Billy Crystal speaks to a wide variety of a human beings. So we, sure, but a certain generation specifically, yeah, we, of we course. we clicked on his HBO special, which, you know, I had remembered it, the years all blur together. I didn't, I could, God, I can't believe it. His, he originally opened, he wrote a book, his 700 Sundays is a book he wrote, which he adapted right. to a one-man play, which ran on Broadway in 2005? December 5th, 2004 to June 12th, 2005, it played 163 performances. That's a long time ago. It was revived for Came 53 performances again. in 2014, and they recorded two nights of it and spliced together this movie of it. The, mm-hmm. uh, the, so it's basically a, it's ostensibly a filming of the Broadway show live. And, you know, I like Billy Crystal. I, I really do. I, I, I think he's done some great work, but I think he's a great comedian. I never saw a lot of his stand-up, you know, back on the, when he would do it with Whoopi and, and Robin Williams. I wasn't old enough, really, to kind of, ha- that didn't, uh, what's the word? Uh, it's not You're like a, part of my, fa- 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 the fabric of my comedic being. But the what he's of your comedic being. <laughs> what he's really great at is he's got a, chari- a natural charisma. He's got incredible timing. He's a great uh, live, not even like improvisational comedian, but just an improvisational character, right? He can just yeah, he reacts to to the room, to the crowd, really, really well. So long story short, this what I love about this one man show is that it is not about. Billy Crystal's rise to fame, which is what so many uh, celebrities' autobiographies become, right? It's about their rise to fame because that's what their lives are. He focuses on his, basically his upbringing in his house on Long Island with his dad, who I didn't know was a famous jazz musician and owned a jazz record shop. And coming in and out of Billy Crystal's home growing up were like jazz legends, and how that it vibed his, in, in imbued his life in certain ways, and his relationship with his parents, and his and and it, it's really focused on the seven hundred Sundays while his dad was alive, really to, to put mm. a point on it. And the story is fascinating, and his delivery is fascinating, and the direction of this stand up is is generally great. I mean, we've got the te- just film the show. Right, I, I, take your different angles and do your things, but they, you know, that sometimes with these things, they splice in some like B roll and some other stuff that is unnecessary, oh, yeah. in my opinion. No, I don't want that. Uh, it's directed by Des Makinoff. Um, uh, also, there's like a weird couple weird edits in there here and there. I don't know if like he there were there are flubs or if they just decided they didn't like the takes. It also feels like there's two endings. They kind of there are some things that I think theatrically, Keith, you, you would notes. be interested. You would you would be yeah. interested in. And also, it's a stark. It shows kind of the stark difference between being a stand-up comedian and doing a stand-up comedy set versus a one-man theatrical show storytelling. Right, because right. for someone who clearly Billy Crystal is clearly known for his timing, there are some beats where you can tell he was directed a certain way that his instincts tell him probably isn't the right way timing-wise. Interesting. And you can tell where you're like. Billy Crystal, the comedian, would absolutely take that beat and milk it, but because they're on a like a set kind of time pace here, he's not holding for the laugh, and it's not working. It's it's there are some interesting, interesting tactical in- decisions yeah. that I found interesting, but I guess if you've only got two shows and you've got to edit that, you've got to cut them together. You've only got two shows to edit together, right? You can only afford to record the two, so. It, there's some interesting For things. Sure, that also, but like this is the second time he's done it. I mean, he's been yeah, ten years later though. So you know, yeah. it's it's interesting. Uh, in no means does that deter from the fact that it's really excellent and heartfelt and uh, pretty great. Uh, we really enjoyed it. My mom specifically. The whole point of this was that my mom, it who is pretty plays her emotions close to the vest. Actually, over coffee that the next morning started talking about all her memories with her dad and and mm. it it unlocked something in her. And that's what the best work can do. If you're so specific in your storytelling that it, you know, a lot of people think you gotta be broad so that it appeals to more people. No, 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 no. If you're hyper specific about your experience, you unlock those 
those tangential yeah. emotions in in other people, and that's what it did. And I and because it did that for my well, mom, well, I knew that it, valuable, then. it is pretty valuable. Yeah. So it, it's definitely worth a watch. It's on HBO or what do they call it now? Max. Max. It's available. So check it out. Uh, it's Billy Crystal's Seven Hundred Sundays. Okay. Well, there you go. Well, Keith, we're at we're we're at time here, but let's. Uh, there's always time for a little bit of K and M Geekly Weekly Rad. Ooh, um, look at that. Yeah. How about that? What do you got for me this week? Well, you know, it's funny you, you talk about the Fourth of July and fireworks, and my you know, my weekly rat is just my uh, my memory of my of our childhood tradition on the Fourth of July, which is uh, we would we would go and see the fireworks. But my my grandfather had a had a boat, or, and the, the family has it now, and so we would go up in Mallets Bay in uh, in Vermont, and we would watch the fireworks from the water. Um, so the, you'd have you'd, on the hillside, you have all the crowd there, but all the boats would line up on the other side, and we'd watch back at the shore with the fireworks over on the boat, and that was always such a a really fun experience for me. We'd tie up our boat next to uh, my gra- grandparents' best friends. We'd tie the boats together, and we would all sort of be there and watch and ooh and ah, and then when it was good fireworks, we'd hit like the boat horn, and uh, it was a, it was a really it was a really fun um, thing that we did every Fourth of July, and I always looked forward to it. And uh, and the boat still still in the family, still there. Cool. And uh, and if you uh, have you ever seen All Is Lost, the Robert Redford yes. alone in a boat. Yes, yes, yeah. It's exactly that boat. Oh, that's cool. Which is which was and creepy. Which, which <laughs> well, well, that's the thing. Like it was like, oh my god, that's the that's the boat. We're on that boat. All the uh oh, uh oh. Now mm-hmm. I'm starting to get nervous. <laughs> It started, all of a sudden, like, I'm never going on that boat again. But that movie is actually a low key masterpiece. His performance there is like, it's great. It's really yeah. great. It's, it's really, really hard good. To do. Yeah. But it was, it was definitely creepy because, like, he goes he goes below deck, and I'm like, oh my God, that's exactly the, it's the same layout. It's the same everything. Uh, I'm going to take a different tra- tack. I was going to talk about something else, but I'm going to, I'll do what you did there. Uh, my, my Fourth of July memory is, like I said, going down to North Wildwood to spend my grandfather's birthday with him. And, we would. He's a Yankee Doodle Dandy. He's a Yankee Doodle Dandy, Grandpa Al, and God bless him. God rest him. And uh, we would that night go to the lighthouse. So down on the kind of on the crest of the beach, you go out on this jetty, and they had this big lighthouse. And then there was a little. They'd have it like a barbecue, you know, jam that night. And there would always be a tribute band come, and they'd be playing oldies. So you'd hear your your Frankie Valleys and your your doo wops and your all kinds of music, and that's growing up. That's all my mom played and listened to. Yeah, and we today listen. the oldies would be like Britney Spears. Yeah. Well, that's what I thought all music was. I didn't know there was contemporary music at the, <laughs> because that's <laughs> yeah, all we me, listened me, to. Me neither. And I just became got such a deep seated love for that type of music. And funny nod, last summer I got a call from this uh, Four Seasons group that I guess had a performance down in North Wildwood that they had got my name for some guy who got a guy their 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 lead lead guy got sick. They asked me if I'd learn a bunch of tunes to go and just like step in, and I did. And it was awesome to stand at the same lighthouse, like mm. summer stage on the beach, and sing those songs for the people that I did growing oh, up. It was cool. like a full circle like, moment. You became the thing, yeah. I became the thing. It was pretty awesome, and I'll always remember it and cherish it. And uh, so, anyway, happy Fourth of July to all you out there. Celebrate, don't celebrate, but uh, we wanted to pass along our well wishes, Keith. Yeah. I think that it. Ooh, 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 oh, oh, it thing? got very dark. Yeah, all right. I guess that's it there for we us. We got a big week of stuff, so uh, we appreciate it. We sure do. Hit this music button. Yeah, hit that music button. Until we talk to you next time, guys, don't let everybody yuck your yum. Keep on doing those things you find fun. And until we all meet again in a few days, keep on geeking on.